the thing. We're going to, so you have to log on tomorrow or Monday, go on Teams, and just be on that list. I'm gonna make it very basic questions, mul very basic multiple choice questions for the terms, for, most of, for a lot of the terms, not all of them, a lot of them. And then remember those short IDs. And I'll repeat it for the camera for, you know, I'll count. Yeah. I hate not using a mouse. I hate not having a mouse. Do you want one? Okay. I'll make this whole bunch of ones. Because I only use it just for the monitor. Mm -hmm. So I really don't need one for that much. Okay, it appears as though we're going. my voice in the background. <laughs> All right. So everybody log in. If you're not, if it's a B day or digital, please log in on Teams and just have a camera on. I want to see you. And it, but it will be on Teams. You'll log in so you can type this one in. Have multiple, it'll be multiple choice. And I try to make them very basic. Some be a little more complex, but most of them be really basic questions. And then There'll be short IDs. And short IDs, I'll give you a choices. So remember, I, I want to give you choices, answer the ones you know. And just to repeat, review for some of you. Um, the first part, three to four sentences, first part, explain what it is or where, or when, you have the basic information about it, identify it. The next part, give an example of it, and then explain why it's important, which means what it led to. This, you know, the creation of the uh, irrigation up to a food surplus that led to civilization. Something like that. So that's all I want. You made it with your books. Oh yeah, we have a test for you. Were you able to watch online? Not a lot, no. So you did a bad internet connection? or? My, yeah, my internet's like really bad. I excited my entire family there too because they're all doing all online. I'm the only one going to school. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, well, um, uh, we have the test on Monday. We're just going to okay. log in, but I'll give you the choice if you need a couple more days. All right. But you have to log in on Monday. All right, I will. Okay. And log in and get on Monday. Okay, and so that's the short IDs, three to four sentences. Those are the best ways. I think those are the best test questions, right? What you know. And so let's go ahead and finish up Vietnam. And the thing was, is that it's going to take about two years to build up enough forces for. We already did the language, right? We mentioned Minoan. Minoan. Did we get to, oh yeah, we got right to here. What we talking about the geography and, yes. which I think is just brilliant. It's just brilliant. Oh, the trireme. So that's the ship. That's right where we went, wasn't it? Yeah. So they bet, you know, many of the first sailing vessels, including the trireme could be used for trade, but they could only go in one direction with the wind, the big square sails in one direction. And so, they needed to be able to row in case they're going the other direction, which this only has one row, but it's copied like the trireme with three. With three, you go significantly faster, stronger ships, the bow, and so there'd be naval combat. We'll talk more about this. We will watch, everything works out right. We might watch a little bit of a movie called Ben-Hur and get to watch uh, Slaves in the Cali. It's pretty cool, yeah. So, like, there's three rows of rowers, right? Mm -hmm. So how big is this thing? Oh, they're big. They I mean, be like... 30 feet tall. And that's one of their big problems. They, um, to be able to move fast with rowing, and especially because uh, they have to move fast, so they, they can't have a lot of things underneath, so they don't really have a keel. So they're really top heavy. So they're hammered by storms. Oh. And so, by definition, they have to stay close to shore. You know, they have to. Or because if there's even a threat of storm, and they're mostly slaves and they'd be chained, so I think you see what could happen if they went under. And the other thing is, this is limited because they can only hold so many products because they need the room for the slaves to row. That's why when they have, when they came up with better sails and have sailing vessels like that, that's why it was such a big deal. You could get rid of the rowers and have all that room for more cargo or whatever you want to carry. 
So the Phoenicians, everywhere. Got to love the Phoenicians. And that is cloth with the purple dye. Huh? The snail dye. Remember the snail dye? The royal purple. And this royal purple, you know, that would make them. Oh, what else did they do besides, uh, what was the other big innovation they had that really helped their trade that no one else went ahead? Glass blowing? Yeah, glass blowing. And what did the Hittites do? What was their big innovation that gave them a huge technological advantage? Iron. Yeah, iron. I think I have one more picture. So this is what we're going to have by the end of the Phoenician era. The Phoenicians, what's the most, the biggest of the cities that the Phoenicians colonized? Carthage. Yeah, Carthage, right here. But they went all the way to here, and I, we see examples of Phoenicians all the way up to here and all the way to India. I always wonder, you know, it's not very well recorded. There's a few examples. How many took off, you know, this way and gone? You know, just gone, disappeared, dead, or off into the Indian Ocean. And I wonder if anybody just, eh. probably not because they have to stay near the shore. But they made it down close to Morocco. And so with that, the Phoenicians, do you have, your no you have notes? Yeah. yeah. And there's where the Greek world was. Just at this time, we have the Etruscans right here, a little Latin place right here called Rome is just starting. We got Assyrians, Babylonians, and Persians. And then right here in the same area, we got to talk a little bit about there. Yeah. Slightly off topic question. So Cadiz, Spain, was mm -hmm. that at one point the capital? Of not of Spain, but of um, Andalusia. This area right okay. here. And because Spain was kind of a, a bunch of kingdoms. Okay. And Cadiz and Andalusia, but that would be the Moorish state with the, the Muslims. I was just wondering, because in Pirates of the Caribbean, one of them, it starts off with like a king or a prince in Cadiz, and I wasn't sure like why they would be there. Oh, that could have been, that was, yeah, that's the king. It's, even when there was a Spain, mm -hmm. they still had the kingdom there. Okay. And so with that, hit the button, okay. Okay, what, in the 700s, the Assyrian invasion, that is the one that would, Okay, the Phoenicians still have great influence, but the flowering of Phoenician Empire would begin to collapse with as they swept through here. And the cruel, very cruel. Remember I told you about all the things they would do to torture people, the Assyrians? And they're the ones who would conquer into Egypt. And, but while that's going on, we have to get to this area right here. And so a little bit about here because of the influence these people are going to have on the West, the Hebrews. And the Hebrews name given to Canaan or, Canaan or Judea right here, this area, this region here, part of the Fertile Crescent. This is going to be a very brief history. And the, important, the reason why is this will become the roots of Judaism, which their Torah will become the Old Testament, and also the first book of the Quran. So a lot of influence here from this area. But I think you can probably see why this had such an important impact. It's location. All the trade routes. All the trade routes. Part of the reason why the Phoenicians were so important, they lived in the same area. Trade route this way, trade routes on the Mediterranean, and here down to the Red Sea, and across here to uh, the Persian Gulf. Yeah? So what happens with the Hebrews? We're going to do it right now. Okay. We'll do it right now. The Assyrians would invade in that area kind of end up Phoenicians, but that also leads to this. And a couple of things about this. Canaan is right here, this area right here. And today it's present day. What countries are here? Israel, Lebanon, Syria. Syria. <laughs> it's that Syria. What country is right here? The British created after World War I. They created that one after World War I right here. Jordan. That's where Jordan is. And this area right here. And Fertile Crescent, a little drier, but in that same, the same kind of animals, the same everything else. And the Hebrews being given to the people who were there, and they would start the name 
what gets worse, Judaism comes from Judah, but Hebrews would eventually be known as Jews, and their holy book would be the Torah. I'll talk more about that in just a second. And like I said before, the basis of Christianity and Islam. Basis is not quite the right word, but the roots, without a doubt. So a very important area in this Virgil Crescent right here. You've got the Hittites, Phoenicians, what an area. So we have this Fertile Crescent, and then here. And so, the history, is a, it's from the Torah, and so it's a little bit hard to know the exact dates, and you know, they, they have people living six, seven hundred years. And so, oh, his name is gone. Maybe I accidentally put him in. Abraham. Abraham is considered to be, the word was patriarch, and patriarch means the father, uh, fatherly rule. He, sometime around 1900 BC, he was, a, he was a shepherd in the era of Ur, we mentioned Ur before, Sumerian city, that came to Canaan. And was there, and we'll talk more about the covenant but the important element of this of covenant, a way to look at it is almost like a contract with their God, which is a little complex. We'll get to it in that in just a second. But he is considered the father of the, um, the Hebrew people who made a covenant through God through his faith. And you know, God's a little complex. Here is a picture of, this is from, this is Abraham, you notice know, the halo. And that's from the Byzantine Empire. So the Byzantines made that. This is probably eight or 900 AD. This is a picture from uh, about 1300 AD of Abraham coming to, coming to the land of milk and honey, which probably wasn't that much milk and honey because it's still pretty dry. But they left Ur and wandered there. It's not really clear. Um, it's not really clear on what people were there, a number of things, but almost certainly this was at a time of drought and climate change in Sumeria, and that's why they went there. Yeah. In that picture, it kind of looks like the girls from the little house on the prairie with the little double braids to the side. <laughs> oh, the hair kind of going off. I didn't even see that. He has that very nice flowing locks, doesn't he? Yeah. Now we're guessing on the eras because in the Torah they really exact, they really uh, stretch out the years. You know, they say he lived to be six hundred and some years old, and uh, that was to increase their stature. You know, if he lived six hundred years, wow, they must be something else. And also, years were relative. But this would be known for them as they saw for the people who lived there. This was their promised land. And this will have great connotations down the road, especially in the year 1948. I meant to kick that. But there were 12 tribes then that would eventually be there. So that's where he gets Abraham's the patriarch, but clearly he did not, even in 600 years, probably have enough children for 12 different tribes. So clearly this talks about absorbing or kind of blending in with the people who lived there. Yeah. But I'm pretty, the 12 tribes were named after his children. His I can't remember if it was his children or not his grandchildren. And yeah, and that's yeah. Betsy, we're not clear. Yeah, we're not clear about the exact roots because there's very little physical evidence of this archaeological evidence, and so we have one source uh, that has been translated over and over and over and over again. But it's in this area somehow. And that's where we get the different patriarchs. We'll come back to this element here, but this area is Palestine. And somewhere around uh, 1100 BC, probably because of drought, and almost certainly there was drought, there's some kind of disaster that hit the entire world in this time. They fled and went to Egypt. And all we know is from what the Torah said. So around 1100, we're guessing, you know, I'll put up the 1065, that's what you'll see. 
The reason I say 1100, this, this era, there appears to have been a series of volcanoes erupting all over the world. And what happens if you get a number of volcanoes erupting? Earthquakes. Well, not only earthquakes. Just like a lot of ash in the sky. All the ash in the air, what happens? Blocks out the sun a little bit, causes temperature to drop. And so there's stories about you know, having um, years without summers. Mm -hmm. And what happens to food? I think you can the imagine, you already have a shortage of food there. They went to Egypt where there's at least more food. And supposedly, they had good relations with the, uh, um, the pharaoh. Well, sometime around this time, they were put into slavery. It was probably, when I put down slavery, almost certainly they were put into slavery about the time of Ramses II, probably before Ramses II, but you know, we're just going to say Ramses II because that's the one that's in the Torah, Old Testament, Quran. Probably debt. They were probably put into slavery for debt. They had a debt, and they could not repay their debt. And so to work it off, they became slaves. That's the most common way outside of war people became slaves. Does that make sense to everybody? We'll talk more about debt slavery. This is a big deal. And for those of you who remember who had American history, heard about indentured servants, they were mostly debtors who were trying to work. The only way to get out of that trap was to roll the die and become a slave for a while to go to the United, what's going to become the United States. And so they begin to work on Ramsey's great temples. By the way, if you watch movies like the Ten Commandments, they're building pyramids. This is way after the pyramids. But you know what? What the heck, right? It's, for the movie, that's more of a spectacular. Here's a very stylized picture of them moving the bricks. But we saw engineering and empire, the amazing uh, monuments for Ramses he made, especially after he lost his big battle and claimed a victory. Good story. Well, they began to work as slaves on there. So this became a very much a part of their foundation and their idea that this is a promised land. Here, this is Byzantine too, but this is probably Moses. And Moses was a Jew who was raised with Egyptians and he would help lead them out of slavery, defying Ramses. And this would become an epic story within the Torah. Hey, if you're going to have a founding document, don't you want to make your story epic? Like most famously when he got to the, the sea, not the Red Sea, but close enough, what did he do? Parted the Red Sea. Yeah. We're talking about, let me go back. I'll show you where it is. Not the Red Sea, it's called the Suez right there. But it's still, that's the story there of the part of the Red Sea, the waters receded and they could escape back into probably the same place they came, but that was between Judah and Israel. And the reason why that's such an important founding document would be, and I'm going over this very fast, this is going to be known as the Exodus. This is a book in the Torah, in the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, and in the Quran. All part of the founding document. And in it, that is where the covenant would get this faith, this contract, would be laid out in the Ten Commandments. And they got the Ten Commandments. So that's the promised land for the chosen people. And eventually they would settle back in the Fertile Crescent. And so this Exodus saga would be a founding story of great courage and bravery and escaping tyranny. And they could say with God's help. But here is a very stylized picture of the Ten Commandments. And this is from about uh, 1600, this painting. I don't think here, it had ye old English. Huh? It's great. Yeah, ye old English calligraphy. <laughs> we should, I should do that. Only problem is I've tried some of those and you can't read them. So I stick with village. I like village. That's my go-to. And the Ten Commandments were religious, a little bit moral, a little bit ethical. Most of them are religious. You'll notice I put them up there very simple, but you, know, you should not take the Lord's name in vain. You know, things like that. This is very much a religious document, a covenant within the church. So it's not like Hammurabi's Code, which was really a law of morals and ethics that we must follow to keep society. This is a more religious document. 
And so this would not be used for the law, the actual laws that they would establish in Israel and, Ju and Judah. Yes? Don't you love the King James Version? What? Of, well, the language is like, oh, yeah. thou shalt not take the, that's the King James yeah. sort of speaking. Yeah, when they, when they, uh, um, and that was a big deal when the King James Version that they did in England in this early 17th Isn't century. Isn't like really inaccurate? Huh? Because they like had stylized and weirded mm -hmm. it up so much. Well, they, they, they uh, translated it into the vernacular English, yeah. That's one of the things when you get things like any document of this time that's translated over and over and over again, they change it to meet their standards of the time, or they just screw up. If you know about the Old Testament, Jonah being swallowed by a whale, that was a screw up. What it meant was Jonah was uh, um, in big trouble, probably dead. And that, the term for that was swallowed by a fish. It turned into, you know, just, you know, just a, a slang. It turned into like literally swallowed by a whale. You know, these are it's just kind of funny about that. Okay, so let's get back to this. So the Torah then would be written after the fact. So this is written after all this happened. But the first five books, that's what we call the Torah. And that's where we get the Old Testament and the Quran from. They all have these stories. I did not put this one in there, but you know, like all of them, every place in the world has a flood story. And in the Torah, who would build the ark? No one. No. But Zoroaster's had that. They had the same flood story in Egypt. They had the flood story in Greece. The flood story was here. And so I don't know if that was a founding kind of, um, a founding story that humans just have, or was there a really big flood all over? You know, could have been something dealing like with the year without summer, you know, something like that. But we'll get to this language in just a second. But a couple things about it then in the Torah. They are monotheistic, but not at first. Monotheistic means how many gods? One God. What's the term for many gods? Polytheistic. <coughs> they were monotheistic, but it's really complex. Because in the Torah, there's two gods. There's two. They have two creation stories and two gods. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because almost certainly they were influenced by Sumerian religions and other religions. You know, they are all together. They all have the same common background. And so the creator was Elohim. God, the creator. And that's the one who created the universe. And then we have a different Yahweh, which would be turned eventually be kind of mistranslated the Greek into Je Jehovah. And that's the Lord. And they're different. Creator, much more interactive in people's lives. And what's going to happen sometime from the creation story to Exodus, they combine them. The one God. And it's really interesting how that happens. So this is the creator. In the Garden of Eden, where creation story, the Zoroasters have almost the same exact story. Almost exactly the same. And he's creating. Does that make sense? He's creating all the animals and a tiger, or a lion, I mean. Here's the Lord interactive amongst people. Yeah. Why is there a unicorn in the background? There's I know, it's so sad. Because when they made that, the thought was unicorns might have existed. You know? sitting on a rock surrounded by flood and it said, oh crap, is that today? <laughs> All right, that's not bad. It's not bad. All right, so I'm fascinated by this. Okay, it still means essentially one God, but it, it, the, the, the foundation roots are really interesting on here. They, they have a definite influence. Can you do the right one? Oh, they also written in this as a very ethical view of the world. All people must lead moral lives. There's certain moral standards. Now, of course, what might be moral to them would not be necessarily moral to us. And there are complexities to the here. And there are certain codes they would do. Clearly, a lot of people got sick from eating self shellfish, so you couldn't eat shellfish, for example. I I'm not idea. sure about why they banned eating pigs. I know they're dirty and filthy and also mean, yes. Wars, right. 
dead, Good point. the dead bodies, and they thought that that was a little too close to public death. That's a good point. I, I, I was thinking more about the way they were raised, and, but you're right, and that is true, and I have read, yeah. Feral pigs. We, and feral pigs are coming right now from Canada. Right now, they're on their way, which is true. <laughs> and they, pigs are big dogs. You can't run you got a bad foot. Which is fine for us. All, you, when the pigs are coming, we just can't be the slowest. So with that... <laughs> I don't need to outrun the pigs. I just need to outrun you. Uh, and pigs... Uh, by the way, we'll talk about this more when Christianity started and the realization hit when... Judaism is not... They, they don't... Since they're more... This idea that we're chosen, they're not trying to in, increase... Get a lot of converts. When Christianity started, they wanted to get converts. And one way to get converts in, let's say, Greece of 100 is to say, hey, you, you can eat pig, pig, it's okay. You can eat shellfish, it's okay. You know, they're, they're kind of, we're going to be illogical here. But lead very moral lives. Uh, anybody know what that is? That's the um, menorah. Holy Grail? The menorah. Good guess on the Holy Grail, oh, but that's a menorah. That looks like and they really pro push this idea of social justice. The idea that we have a responsibility as a society to everybody. And this probably has something to do with the difficult times when they first got there and then the exodus and just barely surviving. But the idea is that we all must care for those who have little. Because not everybody else can have a lot. So we have a moral responsibility to care for others. Because either they can't care for themselves or this concept of, and they saw it very clearly, of bad luck. And they looked at it as, if we don't care for others, for all people, those will be the people that might overthrow the kingdom. Those will be the people that might join with, let's say, the Egyptians and take us over again, or the Hittites or somebody else. We all are in this together. So we must care for all. Now, that did not mean all equal. It's more complex than that. But one of the things, remember I said about debt? After the exodus, they would have this, and this would also be a middle-aged phenomenon, they'd have a debt jubilee. Where it was basically after seven years, for seven, or all their debts for seven years would be, uh, would be forgiven. Debts would accumulate, debts would accumulate, and then just by a, just a sweep, all the debts are gone. And because remember what I told you about money. Money only had value as a placeholder. And who gives or what gives money its value? If it's, huh? People. We just decide it's valuable. We just decide it's valuable. So if somebody owes debt, we can just say, well, we're just going to decide that money is no longer valuable. <laughs> and you have to, and therefore, the poor who have huge amounts of debt, the poorer you are, the odds are you have more debt. That's a great way to care for them. And you'll find in history, will there be a times where people will say, a debt is a moral imperative and you have to pay it. And then they'll go back and say, no, debts are something that people accumulate just in the nature of survival and we can eliminate them. If you're gonna go back to the early parts of the Torah, the Old Testament, or the Quran, it's this. We're not like that today. You know, people believe if you have a debt, you have to pay it back or you're immoral. And that's not what they believed then. It's really kind of interesting to me, the debt jubilee. If any of you plan on going to college or know somebody who goes to college, you'll know a lot about debt very soon. It's not the world I inhabited. That's a, we have a much different world. A little crueler, a lot crueler than what I grew up in. I'm old, though. Yeah. But you, I thought you were saying debt. Oh, no. Well, that meant we were going to shock that. each other. Yeah. Debt. I know, and with the mask makes yeah, it worse. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But people are responsible for their own fate. And one of the things I said is, we all have decisions to make. And the whole world is this fight between good, uh, between good and evil. And therefore, they're a clear influence with Zoroastrianism. Zoroaster was this fight, that Persian, Sumerian religion, this never-ending fight between good and evil. And you see religions like that that... Um, started in areas of very harsh climate where it might be, you know, the river's totally gone and dries up and then horrible floods. And now, you know, so now you're not going to see that because it floods at the same time every year. 
And so with that, there's a big influence, huge influence, on the Torah and Zoroaster, Zoroasterism. Oh, and then those holy leaders we known as the prophets. And we're not going to go into all the details about them, but prophets are the ones that would um, teach the lessons from more and more it's going to be Yahweh. And then as early or as um, as early as the Egyptian as the Egyptian um, enslavement, they talked about a Messiah. And the Messiah was a prophet who would be the savior to save the people who were the chosen ones. And for, for Jews, there has not been, the Messiah has not come yet. Christianity is a different religion, and so is Islam, yeah. I mean, that's where Christianity split off. Yes. Well, began. Yeah. And then seven, six, 700 years, or 600 years later, Islam. Yeah. So, a couple things really quick about it, uh, the Kingdom of Israel. So the Kingdom of Israel would form, in fact, the first mention we have of Israel was before the exile. And it's called the Meritaf Stila, which is right here. And in it, it says, Israel is laid waste, laid waste and his seed is not. Which is shockingly scary. <laughs> but it's mentioned in that. So that's right before the exile. So that gives you, it's not clear about the slavery of the whole issue. The last of the 12 tribes would form the kingdom of Judah. For Judah, you would get Jews, and this comes from the um, patriarch Jacob, and his followers would be known as Israelis, or Israel. And that's where we would get the kingdom of Israel. Saul would be the first king of Israel, and it's hard to see Saul right here. Saul, look at the picture. That does not at all look like the way Saul would have been dressed in. Uh, this is after the Egyptian diaspora or the Egyptian return, but this, is, this was drawn in 1600. This was a 1600 painting. You'll find Renaissance art when they'll draw pictures from the Bible. They'll draw, like they were, they, they'll draw the people like they were dressed in Renaissance era Italy. And they're supposed to be in 4000 BC. But David would be the first successful king we're not sure of the exact dates or even how he took power. According to the Torah, he slew the giant Goliath. And I just like that picture because that's one heck of a head. He had a sling, killed him, intelligence. This is David from a castle in Germany. I like that picture a lot. And I like David as a little tiny guy and then this massive guy. And here's David from, from the Byzantine. And maybe the first successful kingdom of Israel, we have archaeological evidence of David. There's archaeological evidence of David. There's very little archaeological evidence of his son, except for the remnants of the temple. But Solomon, and Solomon would turn Israel into a massive trading state. So we got that a trading state, a complex system of taxes, they would collect gold. His most famous contribution would be the great temple. It's not the current temple with the Wailing Wall because the Babylonians are coming. And Solomon would be known, would get this in the Torah as being the sound and wise leader. Most famous is this story about how to find, you know the story? Two women came and said they claimed this baby and what did he say to do to the baby? Cut it in half. Cut it in half. And the one who said, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. He's asked for to Solomon. Yeah. He's ready to go. <laughs> Look how they're drawn. This is, yeah, this is the, great, uh, the great Renaissance artist Rubens, one of my favorite from the 16th century. So they're drawn like wealthy people in Italy in, in 1550. So I think that's great. I love Renaissance art. We won't take an art day. But their language, which would come from, I think you can see a connection, is very much Aramaic, it's very much like Phoenician language. Remember, Phoenician language, we're the roots of all language. 
and this is the language that people would speak there all the way up until probably 800 AD. Who would take over in 800 AD and make them speak a different language? Romans. Arabs. And they would speak a version close, but Arabic. So, Israel and Judah, after a series, after David, they could not maintain, and they divided into Israel and Judah. Israel and Judah. Here's Israel, the northern part, Judah, and the southern part. Judah would be the most long-lasting one. The kingdom of Israel would fall apart. And then the Assyrians invaded. So we got the Assyrian invasion first, and they just destroyed everything. Then we got that, the Assyrians, and then this one we got again, the Babylonians. Also called the Chaldeans. They took Judea in 586, and they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. They raised the ground, and what happened to the people who lived there? They were all enslaved. Remember we mentioned them before, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar II? They would send him into exile, and they'd be enslaved in Babylon. Sometimes you see this called the Babylonian exile. So, and this is also called the first diaspora, or scattering of the survivor Jews. You see it with the Romans, and you'll see it again in the plague, the diaspora. So, clarify, Babylon invaded. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it'd be the Persian leader, Cyrus the Great, the Persian leader, who would let them go home. Judah would be create, would be still, he would allow them to have their kingdom, but it'd be within the Persian Empire. And then they'd be conquered by the Greeks. And then they'd be conquered by the Persians again. And they'd be conquered by whom? The Romans. And then the Romans would scatter them. And we'll talk more about this later. But the second temple, near the spot of the first temper, temple, would be made in 30 BC. And all that's left is one wall. And that is the most holy spot in Judaism, it's called the Way of the Wall. And that was made when they rebuilt it. The king who did it was Herod. Mm. Yeah. So it, for, for Christians, that name has a certain impact. But I want to get that. We could do more, but I want to have a brief explanation of them. It's, it's another series of amazing stories. It's a little bit complex to tell because there are um, people, uh, measures of people's religion and faith, but they would all have such great influence. We have to give a little bit of the background. And so that's Jerusalem today. We have one of the, mo the most holy Christian spots where supposedly the crucifixion took place of Jesus, the foundation of Christianity. The third most holy Muslim spot where Muhammad was supposedly sent there from Mecca in the middle of the night by Allah, and then the Wailing Wall. Jerusalem's got a big deal. Okay. What were the two, or what was it behind? Mecca, Mecca is the most, right? Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem. Okay. And the temple was rebuilt in 30? 30, and then destroyed again in 70 AD. Okay, so I wanted to get to that. So uh, I'm going to include... I'm just throwing this out here, you know, because I'm just one of these guys who likes to say stuff. But if I was a gambling man, I would say I'm going to give you the choice of, like, you know, domesticated animals, you know, how geography and civilization, uniform, and money. That would be a great choice to pick two of those for uh, short IDs, don't you think? I gave you the list, right? Yeah. So the first four. And then the next one, like Nile, pyramids, Hatshepsut and Ramses. Wouldn't that be another great choice to pick two of those? I like it. I, um, like Marduk, for example, I ran out of space. A little hint, right? But I will ask you on the Assyrian, the, you know, a question with Assyrian, the Heitskus, um, Anton, Amon Re, Khufu. I do say Old Kingdom, Zoroastrianism. I have something about Hittite, you know, iron, right? I mean, I'm giving you hints, I know. But these are things, once I say it, it's like, oh, I've, I've heard of these. You know, I mentioned the Sumerian cities and the city-states. Uh, 
um, Ziggurut, remember those are the big temples. Akkadians, the first one to make of the empire. Sargon was their leader. Uh, ba, ba, ba. It sh I, I try to make it as basic as possible. I don't want to make this that difficult, especially because it's so hard, but I still want you to write a little bit. On that happy note, please check in tomorrow and every day from now on. Someday be the deaths. And we'll see how you feel about it on Monday, okay? All right. So, can I ask a question? Sure. I have a question about something that I thought was weird. Oh, yeah. So, the high schools. Yeah. Why is it spelled high schools? Like, isn't it spelled differently than it sounds? Yeah, I always say high I don't know. I've always said high schools? Yeah, I always heard it high schools. Like, with KSI. That's the way I've always heard it pronounced. The K is not still in there. I know. Well, it's a different place. You know, like. You know, like. <laughs> Witches. <laughs> Only for one. Have a good weekend. Well, see ya. See you Monday. Yeah, just check in. Not a big deal.